Hey, it's Les from the TV Dudes. This week, as part of our special coverage of Austin Film Festival's 26th year, I chat with filmmaker Parker Phillips about his new film, The Bygone, a gritty modern western he made with his brother, actor Graham Phillips. It's a great interview, and I hope you enjoy. Hey, Parker. Hey, Les. How's it going? Going great. I'm so glad we really forgot time to do this. So when I saw the trailer for The Bygone, um, I had just watched El Camino on Netflix, the, the Breaking Bad, uh, I guess, uh, epilogue movie. Um, oh, yeah. And, and one of the turns of phrase that I had seen in reference to that was Western noir. And, and it really stuck out in my mind of like, that's the name of the genre that I like and am missing. I don't think there's enough movies that quite sit in that no country for old men or small town crime or uh, even when they're set modern, that that Western feel. I, I grew up in a relatively small town and the the kind of mundane, life shaking crime and and kind of psychodramas that can happen are, are always fascinating to me. Can you talk a bit about um, the story, how you all got into making this movie? Um what is it in the the DNA of that kind of Western feel uh, that seems to speak to you? Yeah, um, you know, my brother and I we well, we grew up on westerns. Uh, they've always been our favorite genre. So, you know, when we set out to write our first feature, um, we really wanted to start with a western. Uh, it's kind of you know the beginning of cinema in the United States, and uh, you know, westerns are notoriously hard to make. So we thought um, we had luckily we had some investment really wanted to get behind us and so we thought you know we get one shot at this let's at least do the genre that we love and we want to you know bring to the screen um we knew it need, kind of need to be a neo-western just because period westerns are so hard to do um and so we were kind of dancing around this idea of doing a, a missing person movie when we came across an article about these native women who were going missing uh, in north and south dakota amongst the oil fields and we did a little more research into that um and the impact of fracking and, uh, you know, the boom that happened in the way of lawlessness, um, you know, to these small towns that all of a sudden have this influx of mm -hmm. thousands of migrant workers, predominantly male. And, you know, basically in these boom towns, you have these, you know, basically the Wild West kind of starting all over again. Yeah. Um, yeah, the company company runs everything. Yeah, we thought, what an interesting subject matter. No one knows about it. We started going to North Dakota. And we were shocked by, you know, the poverty and the crime and, the, um, you know, the, we talked to the police force and they were overwhelmed. And, uh, so yeah, we started, we started writing the script, you know, that was, that was inspired by these, you know, by these true events. Um, and yeah, we, we ended up shooting in Oklahoma cause we didn't shoot in North Dakota. We did a lot of B roll there and a lot of people, you know, especially the native Americans within our film, they, you know, they have firsthand accounts of some of the, things that we're talking about within the film. So that really brought, um, that really helped our set, uh, and the fact that people were surrounded by others who had been impacted by this issue. What, what lessons did you take forward from making the mediator, uh, as, as you kind of expanded into making the bygone? You know, I think my brother and I are kind of drawn to the more theatric, uh, as far as, uh, the way we dramatize things, the, uh, the way we write dialogue, um, or, or our films tend to be a bit talky, uh, because we grew up in theater. And I think this film's a little bit less than the media. The media just takes place pretty much predominantly on a field. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the mediator was, yeah, it was, in, it, I mean, it, it actually has a lot of similar storylines to the bygone. It's about this, you know, boy who's run off with this, Native American girl and her dad's upset and uh, it's caused a rift between the uh, the town and this Native community and this cowboy mediator sets in to settle the, the dispute and there's definitely similarities within the bygone. Um, I it, it, Because we loved working within that genre so much, we, we definitely wanted to do it again. Uh, but, you know, it's easier to do a short film than a feature film. A short film is usually just one scene, uh, and it's very contained. It's a feature film when you have something that's growing and morphing into this giant thing, and there's so many different ways you can edit it. And, of course, they talk about the edit being the final 
rewrite of a film, and it definitely is. And when you're a writer director, you realize you know this came from an idea, and then you have to write the script and you edit the script, and then you go to you go and you make the shooting script, and then the edit you have to throw out what doesn't work, and you know even our ending. I mean, we ended up reshooting the ending of our movie um, because we saw it a different way, and we wanted to uh, we wanted to give our heroine. Um, a different ending and uh, we ended up having to match a lot of stuff. Um, I was reading an article about the first Star Wars film and uh, uh, um, he was talking about how he had to go in and change the scene, the final battle scene in Star Wars and kind of put in some cuts to kind of give his heroine more of a more of a strike at the end. And I, I identified with it. Um, that's kind of what we had to do hmm. with the bygone. I mean, anytime there's a creative collaboration uh, or, or even just um a common cadre of actors and crew that, that a director likes to take forward. There's a language develops in a shorthand. And, and I would imagine that the production process gets a little easier. Uh, can you talk a bit about working with your brother and, and what it's like to, to not just develop a picture with him, but to then move into these hats where you're, you're literally directing him on set. Uh, do you ever have moments where you have to go, Hey, it's not the good wife, buddy. We're in the West. <laughs> yeah um you know my brother plays a pretty good cowboy we grew up in our family's from oklahoma and texas and uh it's an easy thing and i used to act it's always an easy thing to kind of just slip into but hey, you know it's tough when you're wearing two hats and you know i can't speak totally to that because i didn't have to do it but you know when he's you know he's got blood on his face and he's wearing a cowboy hat and he's you know talking to me and then all of a sudden he has to jump on camera it's definitely a little harder for him <laughs> to stay in character and he he does it great, but it's, you know, you got to kind of remind yourself of the given circumstances sometimes before you enter the scene. Um, as far as our language together, you know, we, we grew up together, you know, we've always lived together in LA. We still live together. I'm doing this interview, you know, from his, uh, from his house, I'm actually <laughs> in his bedroom in LA using his computer because he stole my computer and he's on set right now. So, um, <laughs> we just, we're, we're very close. And I think the only problem is that, you know, sometimes we can, kind of speak telepathically almost. And, you know, when you have a crew of a hundred, you have to make sure that the others are <laughs> also understand what you're saying, because they might not have that same shorthand language that right. my brother and I have. So we, uh, we've definitely learned a little bit, um, in the process and, you know, I'm excited about, you know, our next film and, um, you know, moving forward and you know, keep improving on, on this, uh, crazy medium we've, we've, we've decided to explore. In terms of, of folks carrying forward on projects, I, I know uh, you've worked with Mike McCall before, and, and again, um, are there are there is there a team that you feel like is coming together as as you start as you're getting your career moving on on making these? Do you are you starting to find uh, kind of your band of brothers to to keep making pictures with? Definitely, I was I was worried, you know, doing the feature film, we had to obviously cast more people, and you know, I we couldn't just cast everyone we knew because we didn't know enough. And uh, yeah. we had to, you know, make some offers and write some letters. And luckily we had guys like Sean Hattesey and Jamie McShane from Bloodline, Richie Coster, who I loved in Dark Knight. And, you know, they came on set and all of them were really kind. They gave us big hugs and we're all still friends today. And, um, you know, I, I play tennis with most of them and I see Richie every time I'm in New York and we have this, you know, our family, you know, grew a little bit after this last film. And I think that, you know, when you, you know, when you go around the country and do these films in different states, you're always going to have a different crew. You know, I don't care how big your movie is. You're not going to bring, you know, the whole crew you like, but you can bring these actors and you can bring a couple of department heads. And, um, when the people who are working on the film see that there is a family created, I think, the I think it makes for a much more pleasant set to be on. And that, that's definitely what I signed up for when I decided to do this. In, uh, in, reading your your bio on the phillips pictures site uh, i'd seen that you uh you have a u.s history degree but that your thesis was on indigenous marginalization it's basically a history of western expansion in the u.s uh be another way to put that your interest in that area of history do you feel like that stems from the uh, more fantastical westerns that we all grew up on of, of gunfights in the in middle of the street you know being the central plot of the movie when after you learned the history, those really didn't happen, but a lot of other terrible stuff did. Um, do you feel like your your love of Westerns kind of influenced uh, where you went in college? Um, I mean, it's definitely, uh, I think it was just that there's a bit of ignorance when you grow up on the Westerns that my brother and I grew up on and then realizing, you know, this isn't, you know, really the truth behind it and how, 
underrepresented and misrepresented Native Americans have been throughout cinema. Um, mm-hmm. We have a line in the movie where uh, they're at a drive-in theater and they're watching an old Western. And um, Winnea, our heroine, says, uh, my grandfather always laughed at these old Westerns. And tell me the Indians are never saying what you think. And it's true. Where they would, you know, directors would go up and say, you know, just, you know, say some lines in Indian. And they, they wouldn't even know what tribe they're from. And the, you know, the Native American. American actors inevitably would be talking about the set they were on and the director and how bad he was. And uh, it's all over very famous films now. And something that I, my brother and I realized when we started to research the film until we wanted it in there. And oh, know, that's the great. But I mean, I'd yeah, never, I'd I never think, considered yeah. that, but, but yeah, that's hysterical. And, and of course I could just imagine the, <laughs> the stuff you'd say if you got told that and the director walked away. Totally. Um, yeah. I mean, my brother and I have always been, you know, we're super proud to be uh, from the, the country we're from, but there's, you know, the, the, when you go throughout, you know, even your high school history class, it's just some, some things that you kind of, that get kind of sugar-coated and, um, and you don't really realize. And then you grow up and you, you kind of see the underbelly of it all. And we just wanted to bring a little bit of that to light. In terms of a first big feature and, 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 you know, shooting on gorgeous locations, even, even if you can't be, in the Dakotas, uh, I mean, I'm from Northeast Texas, so we were close enough to the Red River to not have a lot of love for Oklahoma, but it's still a beautiful state. <laughs> I'll, I'll grudgingly admit that it's, it's pretty, even if it turns my car red when I drive there. <laughs> Can you talk a bit about uh, kind of favorite happy accident or, uh, or favorite day on shooting where something really broke your way? You know, we, we got really lucky with locations. You know, one of the neat things about shooting, you know, outside of L.A., whether, you know, you make use of a tax incentive like Oklahoma or Texas or Georgia. So you get these locations that are, you know, not only unique, but a lot of times they're the real deal, the place that, you know, you're actually depicting within your film. Um, and yeah, we got, you know, we originally, there's a fight sequence about three quarters of the way through the movie. That's in a, a, a pipe yard, um, that makes, uh, the oil pipes that would carry, um, you know, the oil throughout mm-hmm. uh, the Dakotas and bring it to their source. And um, anyways, originally uh, the scene was just meant to be in a man camp. But then when we found this pipe yard, we said, you know, gosh, we, we should you know set the fight here. I've never really seen this. And Graham and I, we always joked on set, we called it our bond audition. Um, and uh, <laughs> one day, you know, many years from now, maybe we can direct one, but uh, it, it, it was, it, it ended up being an amazing location. It's usually a a lot of people's favorite part of the movie, but you know, inevitably when you go, you know, to Oklahoma or Texas, you got to battle the elements. And that day I think was 20 degrees and 40, 50 mile an hour winds, you know, and you're, yeah. you're working within these pipes that if they blow over, everyone's going to be flattened like a pancake. So, um, but that was, uh, but we got through it, you know, we luckily never had any ice storms or anything like that, which uh, can easily shut down production. Mm-hmm. And I would say, yeah, that location, you know, yes, we found a yeah, into our movie, takes place underground and uh i was told um quite a bit to rewrite that so we wouldn't have to shoot underground because we didn't have anywhere to shoot but uh with a couple weeks to go we found this place it's called alabaster caverns it's on the oklahoma kansas border and it's just this um this old cave basically and they used to use it as a nuclear uh shelter they used it horse thieves would use it to hide out um it had a ton of history to it and we we ended up uh, building a set underground and we were there for five. I don't think I saw the light of day for about six days, but, um, our only rule was we weren't supposed to wake up the bats, but unfortunately with <laughs> live firearms, live firearms, we woke up the bats. And for the last three days, we had 2000 bats flying around our house. Oh, um, man. But, uh, it made for, uh, it made for a tough shoot, but it made for a, a really unique, uh, yeah. location. And <laughs> it was fun. Well, it uh, the bygone hits VOD on uh, November twelfth. Really, as soon as I saw the trailer, I was like, "Oh man, this combines the kind of crime noir I love with this gritty small town, middle of nowhere countryness that I that I want to see." Thank you for talking to me about it. Thanks so much, Les. I really appreciate it.
The TV Dudes is an independently run podcast and a member of the Electric Sweater Podcast Network. We are exclusively listener supported. If you'd like to help us out, go to patreon.com slash TV Dudes. You can like us on Facebook and Twitter at TV Dudes. All the music for our show is by our friend and original TV dude, Gregory J. Amani Smith. To find out more about us, go to thetvdudes.com and electricsweater.com. I'm Grant Davis. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.